and welcome to the Maasai Mara where we are about to take you on a live safari to see some of the most spectacular wildlife that Africa has to offer. A very warm welcome to the kids watching on Nat Geo Kids. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me and we are really, really excited to share this live safari with all of you. For our regular viewers, in an hour or so, the safari will continue as normal, which means that you can send through your questions in the normal ways. For parents watching with your kids or for kids, you can actually ask your parents to send through your questions and you can do that. They can email them through to natgeokids at wildearth.tv. So remember, because this is live, that means that you can actually get your questions answered as we continue on along the way. And we won't just be showing you the animals here in Kenya. We will also be joined by somebody in South Africa by the name of James, and he will be keeping you all thoroughly entertained as well. So... A lot of the animals that you might see here are very similar to the animals that you will see in South Africa. We get a giraffe out here, we get lots of elephants and birds and lions, but James has got something very special to show you that you don't see every day. Hello everybody and welcome to this National Geographic Kids special show, this time from the Western Kruger National Park of South Africa. That is a very special little bird over there and it is a blacksmith lapwing, but it's only about 10 days old. Can you believe it? Its parents are the ones that you can hear going choop, choop, choop. There they are. It's mum and dad and his name or her name, we're not sure which, is Scubert. <laughs> and Scubert has done very well to get to 10 days old. When they are 40 days old, they're able to fly, and until they're 40 days old, they're very vulnerable, which means that any of the predators that come past here could get hold of little Scubert. And his big defense is to hide. He's very good at hiding. He's very camouflaged in the dirt. Now remember to ask some questions through your parents. You can tell your parents to use the email address natgeokids at wildearth.tv. That's natgeokids at wildearth.tv. And you can ask us anything you'd like to about the wonderful creatures and landscapes that you'll see today. Now, a lot of our regular viewers are very, very happy to be seeing Scubert the little blacksmith lapwing. He's a real favorite of ours. My name is James and on camera today we have got Senzo Mkize. Senzo Mkize is from KwaZulu-Natal which is another beautiful part of South Africa and today he is sporting what is known as a side bun. Never mind about that, it's a an odd sort of hair accoutrement that he's got. We won't talk about it again for the duration of this show. Let's go back to Scubert over there. Can we still see old Scubert? I can't see him. I think he's still down towards the water's edge. He'll be looking for little insects to eat, perhaps a, a few snails. And maybe caterpillars. There he comes. He's coming back up. <laughs> now this special bird is able to run straight away. As soon as he's born, out of his egg, he's able to run. As soon as he hatches. And look how big his legs are for a 10 day old bird and his feet, if you look carefully at his feet, are the same size as his parents. So even though he's only 10 days old, his little feet are almost the same size as his mum and his dad's. I think that's amazing. <laughs> what a special little bird. He's like a dirty blob of cotton wool on a couple of thin sticks. But he's very fast at running and he's very good at hiding. 40 days, I say, until he can fly, so he's probably got another 30 or so to go. Now, one of the things that might eat Scubert, 
and he'll have to be very keepable. Lorraine, you say he needs, he needs to have a security for 30 days. He does need to have security for 30 days. And one of the things that might try and eat him is the following. Let me show it to you. Oh, in fact, there are two things looking this way. I don't think they'll come here because normally they'll eat other things. But if you look over there, we've got two birds of prey. And that means that they're birds that hunt. They are called Wahlberg's eagles. And this pair of Wahlberg's eagles has a very interesting story. The one at the top we think is the female. Now they come back to the same nest every single year. And that Wahlberg's eagle, the pale form Wahlberg's eagle, came back last year and the year after and the year before that and the year before that to the same nest with a different partner from the one that she came back with today. There he is. And we don't know what happened to her original husband because normally they don't change. So maybe during the long migration that they had to make from the middle parts of Africa, just south of the Sahara, maybe her husband met an accident. We don't really know for sure, but what we do know is this year she came back on her own with a new husband. Isn't that interesting? I think it's fascinating. Anyway, they've come back to the same nest, same area, and we'll see what happens over the course of this year. In the meantime, we're going to move on down towards the south of this reserve and see if we can't find ourselves a leopard. That would be very nice to show you. In the meantime, let's go back to Jamie and the Mara. Now, James has been showing you some of the different species of birds that we get out here in the African wilderness. Now, just have a look at this giraffe and see how many birds you can count all along its back and along its neck. Now, this is a bird that's different from the tiny baby lapwing and different to the Wahlberg's eagles. This is a bird known as an oxpecker. And there are probably about eight or so on the back of this giraffe. Now, what they are doing is acting as the giraffe's cleanup crew. So you can see how that one on the bottom of its neck is balanced there, using its claws to grip onto its fur and then stiff tail feathers to prop it up. Now, what it's searching for is ectoparasites, things like ticks, maybe mites, anything like that, that it can eat. Now, it's not doing it necessarily to help the giraffe out. It's actually doing that because that is what it feeds on. But it helps the giraffe get rid of some of those pesky, itchy parasites that are living on its skin. So, in a way, those birds are really helpful to this giraffe. Sometimes, though, they can be a bit of a pest. So if the giraffe has any kind of injury, or perhaps a heavy wax buildup in its ear, or anything like that, maybe patches of raw skin, then the birds will actually peck at the giraffe's injuries, and they'll stop it from healing. Because just in the same way that they feed on ticks, they also feed on blood and mucus as well. Isn't this giraffe beautiful? She doesn't have any injuries. A beautifully elegant animal. Staring out from her position with her head up, up high, looking around to see if there are any potential threats before moving along to see. Oh, look, she spotted something and so has Manu. How cool is this? We've been looking at the tallest land mammal now let's look at the tallest bird. This is a female ostrich, the biggest bird in the entire world. And they're so big that they actually cannot even fly. So as she walks along, they have adapted in a completely different way. Sort of similar to the little lapwings. The lapwings can fly, but they spend a lot of time on the ground running backwards and forwards. Ostriches can't fly, 
but they also can run very, very fast. And if you look at her legs, you can see she's got powerful muscles around her thighs that help her to run as fast as she needs to, to make up for the fact that she can't fly away from potential threats. And there's lots of potential danger out here for a female ostrich like this. Something like a lion or a cheetah or even a leopard might decide that an ostrich is on their menu. So that was a fantastic find. That's what the giraffe were looking at as she walks along past them. I saw some more ostriches off in the distance, so we'll probably go and sit with them for a little bit as well. Now the giraffe is leaning down to feed on the leaves of that bush. Oh, there's so much to see here. There's a warthog as well. It's a sort of an African species of pig. This is why I've come to this particular part of the Masai Mara, because it's very, very swampy. There's lots of water around and mud, and it means that the grass is very bright green and very nutritious for the animals. So this is where they come. And that's why I brought you here, to come and see the different animal species. That's a male giraffe over there. Now, Bob, welcome. Bob, you want to know how many types of giraffe are here? And the answer to that is we only have one species of giraffe here in the Maasai Mara. It is a type of giraffe called a Maasai giraffe, and it is named after the local people of this area. So that's how many giraffe we have here in the Maasai Mara, but the giraffe that James could find to you would be a different species of giraffe entirely a southern African giraffe. So there's different species of giraffe all around throughout Africa. Here we go, look at this. How cool is this? That is a male ostrich and he has seen the female making her way to towards him. <laughs> and he's doing what to the female is a very, very attractive, attractive dance. Look at it go. Swaying backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. <laughs> he looks a little bit silly, doesn't he? But for the female, that is basically like a man in a tuxedo dancing the tango. So she thinks he looks wonderful doing that. Oh, and he's even got his neck in on the act as well. You can see how flushed pink he is. Sitting bull, you want to know if an ostrich will sit on its eggs? The answer is yes, and not just the female ostrich. Well, I see the elephants. We'll come back to those later. Not just the female ostrich, the male ostrich as well will also take responsibility for protecting his family. Look at him go. He's running towards the female. What does she think? Look at him trotting. <laughs> oh, he fell down. <laughs> oh, now we're doing the dance again. <laughs> very, very elegant. <laughs> um, so sitting bull, ostriches, both the male and the female, will take responsibility for carrying their eggs. <laughs> During the day, they will... The most important thing to do is to keep to keep them cool and shaded from the hot Masai Mara sun. And of course then at night when the t temperatures drop. <laughs> Sorry, he's making me laugh terribly. When the temperatures drop. Oh, there's the female. I didn't realize she was there. So there we go. He found his lady friend, and hopefully they'll be able to start a family soon. Michelle says that the ostrich has nice moves. Michelle, absolutely. That was very elegantly done, and he clearly won over the female. So that was 
It just goes to show you can learn all sorts of things from animals out here. Some of which, of course, would be the extraordinary ability to dance. And Jag Seelan, you say John Travolta beat that. I'm not sure John Travolta has anything on those moves, and I think the, the lady over there might agree. Sandy from Greece. She was obviously well and truly won over. He was clearly quite happy to see her as well. So companionship is important in the wild. Here we've got a female and a male giraffe who are also courting. Oh, there we go. The ostrich needs a cool down stretch after those dance moves. So this is a really nice situation with these giraffe because you get a chance to see just how much bigger the male is to the female. So they're standing right next to each other and sometimes it's difficult to see but look here, look how much lower her shoulders are to his shoulders. Look how much smaller she is than him. That's something that we don't often get to see. There you go, look at that. Now she is probably an entire two feet shorter than he is. So she is much, much smaller than him. And generally what that means is that males will be, will feed on leaves slightly higher in trees. Not always though, because as you just saw, the females will all, and the males, will also feed by bending their heads right down towards the ground. Now the reason that he's got such a long neck is not really so that he can eat leaves on the top of the tree. It's so that he can fight with other males and keep them away from the females. So he swings his powerful neck around and smacks the side of his rival. Usually it's quite a harmless fight between male giraffe, but they are very, very strong. And often the female doesn't particularly like the conflict. And if she can, she will try and walk away from him, just like this female is doing here. Here we go, off to find more leaves to chew on. We always think of giraffe as leaning or stretching right up to feed off the leaves on the tops of trees. But they don't have to, as you can really clear see, clearly see. Ah, dragon, now. Let's say we hadn't been able to notice the size difference between the male and the female. Yes, both male and female giraffe have what you would think of as horns. Now they're not horns, they are actually known as ossicones, and that seems like a silly pedantic difference, but it's quite important because they're born with them. Whereas antelope horns will actually grow once the baby has been born, in the case of the giraffe, they are born with them flat down against their heads. And then they start to rise up as the baby gets a little bit older, and then calcify and solidify into solid bone. Oh, she found herself a good twig there. But the male's ossicones are much, much thicker than that of the female. So there you go, you've got a nice comparison. You can see how much broader they are at the base of those, if you think of them as horns or ossicones. And then if you look at the top of the male's ossicones, you'll see that it has been rubbed smooth. Well, we say rubbed smooth. As, as they grow in the males and as they start to get larger, that bald patch sort of develops quite naturally. It's not necessarily just made by fighting. You'll also see that he's got quite a prominent bump between his eyes. Of course, as I said that, he turned away from us because that's just how things work. But he's got quite a prominent bump up between his eyes on his forehead. And that's also used as a weapon between male fighting a giraffe. And he's just going to keep following the lady. And wherever she goes, he will follow. You'll notice that he has a very hairy upper lip and lower lip, a moustache and a beard, 
and the female will have that as well. And the reason, of course, is so that they can feel their way when they're feeding in the bushes and they don't really want to eat the sticks or the twigs or the thorns, so they can feel where the bright green leaves are that they want to eat and it stops them from injuring themselves. Oh, there's lots and lots to see out here. Sometimes staying in one place is the best place to be, but sometimes it comes time to move on, which is exactly what James is doing across on Juma. So let's go see where he's driving to. We are coming up towards a waterhole, and it's quite warm here today about 25 degrees Celsius or so, which I think is about, what's that, 72 odd Fahrenheit? No, it's more than that. It's about 80 Fahrenheit, is it? Yes, about 80, just under. Call it 78. Oh, apparently it's 29 degrees out here. 85 Fahrenheit, I didn't realize that. Okay, so let's go and park on the top of this waterhole wall here and look across and see if we can spot a leopard because there was a leopard seen in this area this morning. Now when that happens, because it's been quite a warm day, you can be almost sure that the leopard will be around about in the same place in the afternoon because they like to do a lot of sleeping during the day. Not always, but often. So let's drive around here sit on top of this waterhole wall and see if we can spot some spotty spots of the leopard. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to see a bird or two even if we can't see a leopard. Right, so you're going to look at the screen and I'm going to look through my binoculars. We can hear the call of the birchal starling. I can't see a leopard yet though. And if you can't see it, often what you're going to try and do is hear if perhaps there are some squirrels or starlings like the one you can hear there making what we call an alarm call. And an alarm call is the sound that an animal makes when it is afraid. And so if a squirrel was to see a leopard, it would make an alarm call that sounds like this. But there are some other birds alarming, and those are called oxpeckers. They're having a big fight. There they are, they've landed on that tree there. It's not going to be the best picture because the sun's at the wrong angle. I'm not sure why they're fighting with each other. It is going towards the breeding season, which, all, which means all the birds are going to start making their nests fairly soon. And that means there's a lot of competition. Jocelyn, the rainy season will come probably sometime around November. Now, we did have a little bit of rain today. We were supposed to have a lot more. Apparently, we were supposed to have about an inch of rain today. We'd get, expect to have about an inch or two this month and an inch or two next month. But then we'd expect to have the really big storms come November. And until then, things will be pretty dry. But not so dry that the animals can't handle them. They are used to it being dry and hot here. Oh, and we've got a special little bird that Senzel's managed to spot. That is very special. And I'll tell you why it's very special. That, everybody, is known as a wood sandpiper. And a wood sandpiper has come all the way from the Palearctic region that is the area around about Asia and Europe, around about that huge area that is Asia and Europe. And those birds have spent their summer 
your summer in the northern hemisphere there and they've come back for our summer this side of the world and that is a distance of probably oh I don't know what is it about 10,000 12,000 miles isn't that amazing I think it's pretty amazing let me tell you exactly where it goes we haven't seen one of those since last summer So it comes from the Palearctic, yes. It goes all the way up to Asia and Europe, which I think is most impressive. Just trying to see if I can find exactly where it goes. Breeds all the way across from the forest tundras and tigers from Iceland and Scotland across Eurasia to Kamkacha in Siberia. So they go very, very far north. The sorts of places that are freezing during the winter, but for a short time in the summer, they're very fertile, nice places for something like a wood sandpiper to live. And they do their breeding there. They don't breed this side of the world. Here they just visit us. They're on holiday here. Now, we have met Jamie, and now we're going to go across to a chap called Brent Leo Smith. And Brent Leo Smith's been sitting with the great migration all the way up in the Masai Mara. Hello and welcome, guys. Great to have you on this afternoon safari. My name is Brent, and I have my good friend Archie on camera. And we're next to the Mara River. And there's lots of wildlife here. And one of the scariest animals of all is on the opposite side of the river. Not the hippos, Archie, but the crocodile. There we go. You got him top right corner. There is a big Nile crocodile sitting on the bank, sun tanning. And if you've ever watched Peter Pan, never smile at a crocodile. Now remember to get your parents to send us questions. We would love to hear from you. And then, of course, we've got the hippopotamuses in the river. Wonderful creatures they are. Oop, under the water they go. They spend their most of their day snoozing about in the water, swimming and uh, avoiding the hot African sun. And as it gets cooler, they're going to head out of the water and go eat grass on the banks of the river. Now they can move incredible distances. In some areas they can move as far as 50 kilometers in a night to get grass. Of course in the Masai Mara where I am they don't have to move that far at all. There's lots of lovely lush grass around. Now remember this is live. Isn't that exciting? You're watching this at the exact same time as me. What else can we see? Oh, there's a baby crocodile. You see the baby crocodile? There's a little crocodile. But still, you should never smile even at a little crocodile. And often there's some nice birds. I know James has been showing you a wood sandpiper. I'm trying to see. We often have some nice birds around the river. Oh, I see some birds moving over there. Let's go have a look if we can get a closer look at them. Look like some little canaries. Very pretty little yellow birds. Canaries. Uh, it looked like they landed in this croton bush. That's the name of this bush that's in front of me. That's it. Hello everybody, sorry about that. We're still looking for our leopard here. We do have a number of technical difficulties with the Masai Mara at the moment. And I think that our leopard came somewhere along here today. So we're going to keep looking as we drive along this bumpy dirt road. I see where some cars were following her earlier this morning. So we are going to just keep our eyes peeled a leopard is a very special animal to find. 
and they're very difficult to spot because of course they are very well camouflaged let's keep going along here we're also looking for all the other kinds of animals as well Anyway, we may try and find a tree if we cannot find a leopard for you just yet. Just want to try and cover some distance because we don't with you kids for very long, only about an hour. So we need to try and see if we can find this leopard. Not a lot of animals around here, which makes me think maybe there's a predator here. Now, as I was telling you, we are going towards the springtime which means there are little signs of spring everywhere. A lot of trees have got buds on them and what passes for flowers out here. Sometimes the flowers out here don't really look like exuberant cherry blossoms like you might see in some parts of the world. But all of the trees here have to produce flowers and sometimes they're very small and a lot of them you will find at this time of the year. So if I can find some of those, we'll definitely show them to you. Now let's go down towards the south here. We'd also be looking in the tops of the trees for this leopard. They can climb really well. So let's carefully scour the landscape. Now we had reports that there was a leopard around here this morning. Oh, I can't see a leopard, but what I can see are some impala. So let's have a look, see at them. There we are. Some impala over there. Beautiful antelope. And they are, of course, the most common antelope that we get over here, occurring in large herds. And those are females. And there's one male there with horns. And they occur at this time of the year in mixed groups. Sometimes of the year, they really don't like each other very much. The males don't like each other, and so they fight. But at this time of the year, everyone's pretty friendly to everyone else. Oh, and there's a blackbird there called a fork-tailed drongo. He'll be looking for insects. And those insects will most likely be kicked up off the ground by the impala. So as the impala pick grass and bite bits of vegetation, so insects will fly up and fly away, and the fork-tailed drongo will swoop down and grab them. Glad I don't have to eat insects kicked up by impala. That wouldn't be very nice at all. And they're feeding around that big area there. And that big area that you can see with no grass on it is a termite mound. And termite mounds, although they're full of termites, are very nutritious. And that means that the, well, the soil is very nutritious and that means that the grass that grows out of them is very nutritious. So you'll often find herbivores around termite mounds. Now, let's keep going along this road. I can hear a little bit of what we might call consternation, which is an alarm calling birds going chip, 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 chip. They might just be fighting with each other or they may have seen a predator. So let's go along here and have a look. See what we can find. Look very carefully because you could very easily drive past a camouflaged predator. All right, in the meantime, let's go across to Jamie. She does have some communications and an elephant, which is very exciting. And hopefully that elephant will be very entertaining. Now, James is looking for something that is secretive and hard to spot. Now, believe it or not, these animals can be secretive and hard to spot at times as well. But luckily for us, 
They are right out in the open, enjoying the bright green grass of the swamp. So remember how I said that this was a good place to come and look for animals because there's so many of them gathered around this green patch. Well, here you have it. There must be close on 50 or so elephants up ahead of me. I couldn't get any closer to them because there was an elephant in my way. And because this is their home and not necessarily mine, I always make sure that they are given the right of way, which makes absolute sense, surely. If we get to visit them in this natural habitat, we treat them with the utmost of respect. And of course, there is the fact that they are big and wild animals. So they should always be treated with respect no matter what. There's a lot of baby elephants in this particular herd, all sticking closer to their mothers if they're very young, or if they're slightly older, showing a few streaks of independence and spending a little bit of time away. Like this little chap, not too far away from mum but spending time learning to use that trunk of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of uh, time with these guys. Oh, look, another bird to add to your collection. We've seen lots of birds today. That is a black-bellied bustard. Very cute. The elephant, I mean, not the black-bellied bustard. Oh. Sometimes you actually see little elephants chase birds away. It's a part of basically their learning experience. Now this is, looks like a little female, it is. It's a young female elephant, so she will be slightly less boisterous than a male, but not by much. Rocky, will you say, wow, so green here. It is very green here. Look, the Maasai Mara receives an enormous amount of rainfall every year. On average, around about or well, over a thousand mils. This year in particular saw the highest levels of rainfall in the last 60 or so years. So it really does rain an immense amount out here. And for the animals, that is wonderful. It means a completely different type of ecosystem to the one that you will be seeing with James and Juma. You'll notice it's very dry, very brown. It's just coming out of the dry season. Here in the Maasai Mara, the dry season is really only the month of July. And after that, there is, and even then it rains. After that, there is plenty of rain to keep the grass nice and green. So for animals like the elephants or these playful topis behind them, and topi love to run, just purely for the sake of running. That is something that is very helpful for them. Our Mark, speaking about birds, migratory birds, all sorts of things, you wanting to know about those white specks behind the elephants, the white birds. The answer to that is that they are bald ibises, which we are seeing vast amounts of at the moment. There might also be some egrets around. I haven't seen any though. Those all look like ibises to me. I haven't seen any egrets, but you often see, look at these topi with their bobbing heads. You often see the, the egrets around the elephants and the antelope. And the reason for that is because they're insect eaters. So as the as the elephants move through an area, then they disturb the insects and the egrets can swoop in and grab them. But these ibises are living in the swampy area, even more swampy than where we are now, and they are probing the mud for any sort of invertebrate. Now, they don't really rely on the elephants disturbing insects. They feed in a completely different way to the, to the egrets. So I thought we might see some egrets around here. I don't see any, though. I only see the ibis at the back. Beautiful topi in the forest. In the background, by the way, is the great Mara River over there. So that's what you're looking at. That's why all those trees are there. 
Let's go catch up with our elephants because close encounters with elephants, particularly big herds like this, are really quite special and quite lovely. And the two males have moved off the road now, so we can go a little bit closer. And there's some tiny babies in this herd, so it'll be nice to spend time with them. You'll notice, of course, the animals are very relaxed with our presence, not at all concerned that we're here. And that's simply because they're accustomed to safari vehicles. They don't see them as a threat in any way. Now, we have a question. Oh, hold on. We could actually end up getting stuck trying to find these elephants. We have a question about what temperature it is here. At the moment, here in the Maasai Mara, it is around about 25 or so degrees centigrade. So not far off in, or not far off 75 in Fahrenheit. The climate of Kenya and the Maasai Mara in particular is really quite pleasant. It's very temperate. We're close to the equator, so the temperature doesn't change too much. But at the same time, it, oh, hold on. We're quite high up, so it doesn't get too hot. So we get nice, even temperatures. It's usually around mid-50s Fahrenheit in the mornings, and then this will be about as hot as it gets. It might go up to 86 or so if it's a really, really hot day, but that's unusual. Here we go. Our Brenda would like to know if I've seen any baby animals today. And the answer to that is well we've, we've got some baby we've got some baby elephants this morning i saw some baby spotted hyenas belonging to a very special a very special hyena known as waffles and a little bit later this afternoon we are going to go and have a look at a jackal den where yesterday we found tiny tiny little puppies so i'm hoping that they might come out how beautiful is the scene? There's just elephants everywhere. They seem to have decided, though, that they're on a mission, marching off towards the sunset. Oh, I say sunset. We're not quite there yet. It's only quarter past five in the afternoon here in the Masai Mara. So we've still got a little way before it gets dark. Oh, I see something very interesting. I'm sorry, I know we're looking at the elephants, and we will continue to look at the elephants, but we've been talking a lot about birds, and there's some fascinating birds. I'm going to move slightly because I don't think the camera can reach them. But down there is a very big bird known as a ground hornbill. Now, that is a bird that might follow behind elephants because it does eat insects. So there we go. I think I can see four of them. They're far away, but still, oh, that's stunning. You can see the bright red color of the mature adults and then the sort of yellowish facial color of a, an immature individual. And I'm sorry, it was the question about the temperature came from Olive. By the way, Olive, it is really quite nice and warm. I would say that if you ever do come to the Masai Mara, make sure you bring plenty of skincare products to help to protect your skin against the sun. Lots of hats, sunscreen, sunglasses, all of those sorts of things. There's buffalo in the background. There's elephants in the background. There's waterbuck over there. There's just so much for us to look at. There's the egrets. I knew they had to be somewhere. So those white birds over there are egrets as well as some black-headed herons. That is to continue to arc answer Mark's question. Here's another waterbuck over there lying up in the grass. And a topi. And a waterbuck. Now, Brenda, you wanted to know about baby animals. 
It is topi birthing season, so another reason why I've come this way is to hopefully have a chance to see what a baby tope to show you what a baby topi looks like. I haven't seen any yet though. We're still searching carefully. There's a giraffe. Oh my goodness, there's lots and lots to look at. There is a topi antelope in its prime. It looks like she might actually be pregnant. Potentially. She's starting to bulge down at the belly. Beautiful. And as I said, there's the Mara River in the background. Now before our elephants get too far away, although luckily they've decided to settle down, let's chat a little bit about elephants and their social structure because what we've got here is a combination of a whole load of different herds that might be related to each other, they might not be. Elephants are not territorial. They are quite happy to wander around in large groups, in small groups, but there is one basic unit and that is an elephant herd or breeding herd that is made up of females related to each other and their offspring. Now if a female or if a baby elephant is a female they will stay with their herd for the rest of their lives but if it is a male like those boisterous boys at the back who were fighting a little bit a moment ago they will then get kicked out of the herd when they're about oh, between 13 and 15 years old. It really depends on the individual. So for little, well, for all baby elephants, this is the ideal environment to grow up in. They've got the protection of every single herd member around them. If there's any sort of a threat, the elephants, the adult elephants, will rush to the defense of their babies. But Tim, no, I don't think that this is one herd. A herd is really between about 10 and 20 individuals. Sometimes you get larger numbers, but that's really about as large as they get under normal circumstances. So this is probably several herds combined, as well as some big males and some slightly younger males who have joined in because they've seen all these females wandering along and they've come to investigate and I think honestly just to have some company as well. I think that the male elephants quite enjoy the company of the herds. I'm not so certain that that feeling is reciprocated. Watching elephants use their trunks is a lesson in dexterity. Less so for the youngsters who are still practicing their coordination. They're not quite as good at scooping up the trunkfuls of grass that they want. And they have to be slightly more finicky about the whole process. Although these two have got an okay grasp. But you'll see how they're only really getting a few strands at a time. Not quite as practiced as the adults around them. It makes sense. Youngsters learning to use their trunks in the same way that toddlers might have to use their hands or learn to use their hands. Okay, as we continue scouring the swamp for exciting things, oh, there's a big male at the back. James is still scouring a Juma for a leopard, which admittedly is a little bit harder to find. <coughs> It's very hard to find a leopard, everybody. So now I'm going to show you one of the favorite things to see out here. Since was this too close? You can get it. This, everybody, is a little bit disgusting, but it's a very important part of the wilderness. It is hyena dung. Now, you would never touch this with your fingers, and that is because any carnivore, that's a meat eater, has dung that is quite possibly poisonous to human beings, so I would never touch it with my fingers. But what's very interesting is that you can see that it is two colors. Can you see that? One is a pale green color, and the other is a white color. Now, the pale green color is what happens when a hyena's amazing digestive system uh, digests bones. 
and it comes out greenish and then it turns white in the sun and that is because of the calcium that is in the dung. Now, I suppose you will learn about calcium probably when you're a little bit older than you are now, depending on how old you are. But calcium is a very important metal, actually, and it turns white when it is exposed to oxygen and it's exposed to light. So that's what's going on here. This hyena would have made his dung mark here as a marking of territory. Nothing really goes to waste out in the wilderness, and even dung is not considered waste. So this dung will be here so that other hyenas who do not belong to the Juma clan of hyena, they will know that this is not their area when they smell and see this hyena dung. Don't worry, it doesn't smell too bad at the moment and that's because it's not very new. It's quite old. So there could be hyenas around here, but we're not finding a great deal at the moment and sometimes in the wilderness it's difficult to find animals and sometimes it's very easy and this afternoon happens to be one of those afternoons where it's a little bit difficult. So let's keep going. <laughs> Ruth, that's a very good question about mosquitoes. You say, do adults ever, or do animals ever get bitten by mosquitoes? The answer is yes. Do they ever get malaria? The answer is no. Malaria only affects human beings. I think it might affect some of our primate, closest primate relatives, but I think it's actually only human beings. And the parasite called plasmodium that causes the problem needs both the mosquito and the human being to survive. But it doesn't help having an impala around. It doesn't help having a kudu around or a leopard for the mosquito to bite, that doesn't help the plasmodium, and so it really does have to be human beings. So animals don't get malaria, only human beings get malaria. Animals get all sorts of other diseases from various insects, but because they have lived here all of their history, in other words, they don't live in strange places like cities, they don't travel overseas, they don't go all over the place, you'll find that animals have develop the ability to deal with the diseases that occur in their areas probably much better than we as human beings have the ability to deal with diseases. Also, they don't live stressful lives like we do. Oh, now let's go back to the river with Brent and his crocodiles. I hope before the end of this drive we're going to be able to show you a leopard. We just hope. It's always lovely here at the river. You never know what you're going to see next. At the moment, on the other bank, we've got a lovely herd of topi. Now, kids, remember, if you want to get your questions in quickly before the end of your special children's show, get your mom and dad to send them through to us. I would love to hear from you. Now, I love sitting at the river. Not only have we got lots of animals, we've got hippos, we've got crocodiles, we've got birds, and I just like the sound of the river through the rapids. So let's have a look what's around. We've got some big crocodiles on the other side, just lazing about. Now, crocodiles like to suntan because it warms up their body and it gives them more mobility. So early in the mornings, crocodiles are very slow at waking up. And we've got a lovely big herd of impala that will try avoid the crocodiles at all costs. Wait, actually, let's stick on the crocodiles. Let's look at their teeth. Look how big their teeth are. Isn't that scary? Isn't that amazing? Now, these crocodiles only eat properly for a few months of the year when the animals swim across the river, but for most of the year, they'll just laze about. They will sometimes eat the big catfish that live in the river, but for the most part, they rely on the wildebeest and zebra. And you've always got to check carefully around here. There's often lions waiting around these areas. And we've got a lovely big herd of impala up on the ridge. Uh, we've got a question from 18 
Do the crocs go after the hippos? Uh, 18, no, not normally. The hippos are actually much bigger than the crocs, and a hippo has a very impressive set of teeth, and they can actually bite straight through a crocodile. A big hippo's lower, um, lower canine uh, can be as long as 60 centimeters, so almost the whole length of my arm. So I'll show you how big that is now. So a hippo's low incisor can be that big, so it can go straight through a crocodile. So you've got to be careful of hippos as well as crocodiles. I'm just trying to check behind me what's going on, because you never know what could happen here at the river. As I said, there's often lions hiding in these bushes. We've got some more hippos downstream, more hippos upstream, and we're just looking for some birds. Okay, well, I'm going to keep sitting here at the river. While I do that, let's send you all the way back to James in South Africa. Yes, here we are, and we've got some very special little birds over there. I wonder if you can see them there. They are called chagras. They're a kind of a shrike. Naturally, they're now flown away, so we can't see them. Oh, come on, jump up into the branches. <laughs> Nasty birds. We haven't had much luck this afternoon, have we? There's one hopping around. That's not a chagra. That's called a rattling cysticula. You can listen carefully. You can hear it going... <coughs> Brenda, yes, I have been to Asia to see animals. I've seen tigers in Asia and rhino and Asian elephants. And this was all in India. I've also been to the far east of Russia to look for tigers, but I didn't see any there. That's quite nice. Beautiful birds. So it's not all about the big animals. Often just spending time listening to birds and looking at them is just as satisfying. Brenda, I don't own any pets, no, but my father and mother own pets, and I have owned pets as a, as a child. I owned pets. My father has a dog. His name is Fenton. And my mother has a cat. And I think I've forgotten the name of my mother's cat because anybody who meets the cat only calls it Kitty. But I think its name is Zoe, as far as I remember. <laughs> And the rattling cysticula looking for insects to eat and often feeding with other birds that eat insects especially a bird called the southern black tit which you might find flying around here going bzz, 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 bzz. Ooh, sends her quickly on the road look it's a very special little carnivore and that's called a dwarf mongoose and if you look, listen very carefully and you watch its mouth you can see it's making little squeaking noises and it's gone. What a pity about that. Let's see if we can't find one last thing or two before we leave you. Maybe we'll be very lucky. We've only got about a minute left, I think. And then it will be the end of the kids' drive for another week, and we'll see you again next week. Oh, come on, we've only got 40 seconds left. Surely we can find you some other wonderful creature that we have out here. There are so many. Oh, well, I suppose there is always next week. So I hope that you will join us next week same time same place on the Nat Geo Kids YouTube channel and you might like to join us for our regular safaris uh, every other day of the week on YouTube you just go to Safari Live until then I hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Saturday bye bye <laughs>